welcome back to Bible study, to the Acts of the Apostles with uh, not two apostles, but Ian and Alan, leaving him. Hi. Now, you're, probably, you're, you're probably more apostle-like, appointing elders and things like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, anyway, we're, we're just here to sit at the feet of Luke and, and um, read these amazing accounts. It's, it's all kicking off this week um, with uh, conflicts and discussions, so... We might not have them in the studio here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Ian's going to read yeah. verse, uh, verse 1 to 21 of chapter 15. Okay. Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, and I'm reading in the New King James Version of the Bible. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out a people from his, for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins. I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For, Paul, for Moses has had throughout generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight, as we contemplate these words, I pray that you give us a spirit 
understanding, of wisdom, of knowledge. That we might draw close to you, Father. That we might know you more and more, better and better. Walk our lives closer and closer to you. Certainly there may be some viewers who are Gentiles and there may be some viewers who are Jewish. But it is your will that each of us knows you, who is from eternity, it says, mm. from eternity. So we seek to know you. We seek to live in your presence. So help us by opening the eyes of our spiritual understanding. Amen. 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 Yeah, I find that verse so powerful, known to God from eternity are all his works. Yeah. And we get involved in all sorts of disputes, don't we, on minutiae uh, and, and try and just win this point or that point or this insight or that insight. But God knows the whole thing from the beginning to the end. It's, I think it's really difficult for us to be sitting here mm. 2,000 miles away and 2,000 years later to try and fathom what was happening. Mm. Because last week, we looked at a passage in which Jews from Antioch and other places came and caused Paul to be stoned to death. They thought he was dead. Mm. Paul the Jew. Paul the Jew. So the Jews came and stirred things up yeah. because they were opposed to what Paul was doing, what Paul was saying, what Paul was preaching, what Paul was teaching. They were so opposed that those Jews were ready to murder, which is against the law, which is against the Ten Commandments. Mm. But they were prepared to break their own law as a matter of principle, mm. to silence Paul. Although they were interpreting their law that what that, that was more an execution than uh, of the Absolutely. law. Absolutely, there, there are going to be some kind of justification. Yes, yes. we can always drum yeah. up some yeah. justification. Yeah. You know, I'm a lawyer, so I, such so. people should <coughs> be put to death. <laughs> I know all the you know defense arguments. Mm. In this case. Satan didn't stop there. In this case, these were Jews from Jerusalem, but they were believers. Correct. Mm. So the difference is they didn't stone Paul, but their objective was exactly the same. They wanted to silence him. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Um, they wanted to stop him. They were him. believers. You were, of course they were believers. It said of the sect. Yeah, because they were the believers Pharisee. in Yeshua, yeah. they wouldn't resort to murder because they have the Holy Spirit, but they were of the same mindset as the Jews who weren't believers. Mm. It was just their method that was different. But is it that difficult for us 2,000 years later, mm. 2,000 miles away to appreciate it? I don't think it is. No. I think this is, has been played out through church history and it's played out throughout churches today, the, these sort of divisions. Uh, but this is an absolutely crucial division. Yes, and it's one of the, f if not the first one, yeah. that the church encountered. And the most enduring. <laughs> but, but from is, different sides, it sort of triggered it that way, and then that, there's a sort of retaliation That's that what's way. extraordinary about it. You'd have thought that chapter 15 of Acts would have resolved it. Yeah, mm. that's right. And then we have Galatians. You'd have thought that resolved it. Mm. We even have Peter saying, whatever Paul writes is complicated, but it is scripture. Mm. You'd have thought that would have resolved it because Peter was also involved. 
I mean, this but then was... there's the, there's the description of the uh, in Suetonius mentions that those were who were ejected from Rome because of Christos and and they were they were Jews. They were they were basically you know disputing and that's and that created another dynamic in the Roman Church mm. and then. Um, Paul says to the Gentiles, don't be arrogant, you know, looking on the Jews. So, so it's flipped the other way. And then you, you obviously have the, San, the later Sanhedrins and, you know, Jewish tradition, which obviously sees Jesus as, as Hitler. <laughs> and um, you, because of the way the church fathers talked, John Chrysostom and others, um, denigrated the Jews and that the ding-dongs actually happen right through church history. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I, I suppose what you've got to actually do is, is ask the, yourself the question, what is going on here? Why are they insisting that Gentiles become Jews mm. in order to be part of their the salvation hey. plan of God. Mm. Why, why is that happening? Why are they insisting? And this is where I would agree with what you say, that this is an argument that's been played out time and time again. You can get actually involved in the theology of it, and Paul does in Galatians and, and, that, Romans. and Romans, but in essence, the reason why it just carries on, carried on as to what you'd ask the question is that it really didn't have anything to do with theology. It was about control. It's about they're one of us. We only want people to come in who will be part of us and be like us mm -hmm. and will accept our way of doing things and our control. And that's in essence is what's going on here. Mm -hmm. and, and Yes, you can get involved in circumcision and all sorts of things like that, and you know. The, but it's worth looking at that because that oh, was the first issue. Is that, it in was. Fact, my Before Bible says. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying we shouldn't discuss. No, 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 you know why circumcision was an wa issue. Was an issue. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but you need to understand what it was, even when they solved it. I know it wasn't solved. It wasn't solved because it wasn't anything to do with the theology, and a lot of arguments. In, in, in church life have nothing to do with theology. They're, they're actually co clothed in a theological language and sometimes they get a theological justification, but it is basically the same old story that you're threatening my control. But anyway, when it comes to, and, and then Alan can pick up, when, when it comes to this first point of contention, um, Paul goes straight for it in Romans 4 when he says, was Abraham justified, uh, was his justification before or after he was circumcised? It was not after, but before. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness he had by faith before he was circumcised. So Paul makes it very clear that you're not saved, you talk about the salvation plan, by following the law one of which was the law of circumcision. You're justified, you're saved by faith. So in one sense, the dispute that we think, oh no, this is terrible, this is a sociological you know, inevitability because people want control, is actually God, in God's sovereignty, it brings out a truth later in Paul's writings that you're justified by faith. And it probably sharpened his thinking. Yes. But before we get into the theology, I just wanted to pause a moment on the human side of it. Just imagine what Paul and Barnabas are feeling. They're just being on for them. They're gonna go on larger, longer missionary journeys later, but at this point, they've just been on an epic journey. They've seen souls saved. They've nearly been killed. They've appointed elders in every place. They came back to Antioch full of stories of how God had met them on this journey, how the church, the kingdom of God had expanded, how the church 
had expanded, what God had done with them. It was all initiated by the Holy Spirit. And they were full of joy. They were full of encouragement. They were full of vigor. And they had just overcome being stoned. They had just overcome being rejected. They had just overcome all of these persecutions. And it was embedded in their preaching and teaching that through persecutions, you will enter the kingdom of God. Mm. And they thought they were on home turf and they were safe for the time being until if they get called to another missionary journey, they have to roll their sleeves up and get ready to more persecution. So they're just relaxing. Yeah. And then boom. I know. This time the attack comes from within the church. Yeah. If, if neither foes nor loving friends can hurt you, is the line from Kipling. Or the line from Tyson, you did that. Um, everyone's got a plan until they get a punch in the face. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, but they obviously, you know, man proposes, God disposes. So this isn't, this isn't according to a plan. They've come back, you would have thought, yes, let's, let's get the charts out and plan the next journey. And this they have to face. Mm. It is yeah. the real world. It is the real world and it doesn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. Just because you go on a mi uh, successful mission and you come back full yeah. of joy and full of yeah. the works of the Holy Spirit and everything, yeah. the persecution is not going to stop. Yeah. And some of it could come from within. Yeah. That's the problem. That's it. And, and then you, you discover where the real power is. <laughs> you come back and the armchair sort of experts are there. Mm. And, you know, no, no, never mind you. I, I, we'll, talk, we'll, we, we'll let you come in in a minute. You know, let me, you know, we're just going to tell and, you how it is. And the thing is that, you know, Ian mentioned it before, that some of it is possibly control. Some of it is... Well, more than possibly, it's, it is control. It's church politics. I mean, let, let's call a spade a spade. Mm. Okay, who's in charge? Whose rules are we playing by? Mm. But they use theology to attack you. Yes. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you're very successful. You just had a very successful campaign. You've come back to your home church. Somebody doesn't like you. And they say, well, where do you stand on the second coming? Are you pre or post? And are you this? Oh, no, well, we can't have you now. Mm. It's got nothing to do with pre or... Mm. It's an excuse, but it's a theolog... They, they, don't, they can't say, we don't like your face. Mm. They can't say, I'm jealous of you, you're more successful. They can't say, I want you out of town because of my personal ambition and I want to get rid of you, they bring in theology. This is also a classic case of, of new wine, old wineskin. So they've, they've got their structure in place. They're sitting there, you know, wherever they are in their little council. Where was it? Um, they came to, from Judea. Judea. Uh, where were they? Because uh, they were sent off to Jerusalem later. So they've got their tradition, and Paul and Barnabas come in with the spirit, as it were, and... and all they can do is say, right, you've got to go to the, the mm. church in Jerusalem. Mm. Yeah, because so what Judea was the... I, I'm thinking that the church Ju in Jerusalem is going to back them. The, that's right. Judea was the seat of power at the time, mm. Christian power, right? Yeah. Not that there was much power, but... Uh, uh, yeah. Judea was the center. All right. They were the big cheeses. And all of a sudden, this upstart Antioch up north somewhere one of the regions yeah. in the provinces, mm. Antioch, is now claiming that they've experienced miracles, they've experienced revival, they've experienced mass conversions, they've experienced planting lots of churches. Uh, let's go and bring them down a peg or two. Let's go and tell them the theology is wrong. You see, I'm not exactly sure where they were. The certain men came from Judea but then they were sent on their way to, uh, through Phoenicia and Samaria, obviously, to Jerusalem. So it's, it's somewhere just on the tail end of their journey. Mm -hmm. that can be, someone can correct me exactly where it was. But, um, but I think they were sort of tin pot judges. Yeah, but know? Judea is south of Antioch, okay? 
sort of in the direction of so Jude. I, I, no, but it says they had come from Judea. Yeah, certain men came it's down. So I'm, I just don't know where Judea. this actual dissension was. The exact point. It was obviously at the end oh, of the I journey. See. But, I see. Um, I before see. they went through Phoenicia and Samaria. Oh, I thought they went through Phoenicia and Samaria not on a missionary journey, but en route to Jerusalem. They did, exactly. So yeah, I'm just was saying, just on at this journey. point of verse 1... Oh, in verse 1, they were in Antioch. They just, oh, Antioch. There it's, we are. In verse 26 of, yeah. of chapter Got 14, it. they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God. Got it. Okay. Got it. I've got it. So they were in Antioch again. So they'd done a circuit mm. back to Antioch, mm. and they were back in Antioch, where they had been sent off from, and they just finished their first journey. Yeah. And they had told the disciples what God had done with them. Yeah. And they're just sitting there thinking, wow, this is really great. And then these guys from Judea show up and saying, exactly. actually, you're not doing that great. Exactly. Guess what? You got your theology wrong. Yeah. Mm. And they tried to take the wind out of their sails. That's what was happening. So the people came up from in the region of Jerusalem to Antioch because they'd heard something was going on in Antioch and they were pointing the finger. Yeah. So the men came up from Judea and taught the brethren. In other words, they undermined Barnabas and Paul's teaching. Mm. Paul had been teaching all along his journey. And then they came along with a different teaching and said, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Yeah. And all along, Paul had been saying, if you believe on Jesus, you'll be saved. Yeah. Mm. It is quite a big issue. Therefore, well, when... It, yeah. it, is, it is an issue, and, and you, you have to ask the question, um, okay, then the, a, a new convert comes in, they become, get circumcised, they become a, a Jew, they keep the commandments. Where does baptism fit in? Because Jesus, mm. you know believe and be baptized. Mm. So, so in a sense, they're setting aside one of the main teachings of, 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 of the Lord. Mm. You know, when he, he said at the end of Matthew 28, make mm. disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So wh where, where does, where does you, you've got these two parallel lines. Mm. Uh, Absolutely. Going, going together. And also not adjusting in their mind, they still see Paul from what you brought out last yeah. week as the beginning of chapter 13. Who is he sort of thing? Yeah, he, he's the Barnabas' fish. sidekick. Yeah. They still considered him Barnabas' sidekick. Yeah. And, and you... And as far as, if I can just comment yeah. on that baptism, um, yeah. uh, Ian. Yes, the, the thing about baptism, when Jesus used the word baptism, he's not talking about the washing, he's talking yeah. about the burial. Yeah. Right? And if you place baptism where it ought to be in the context of burial, somebody who comes out of the waters of baptism, which is why I believe in full immersion, there has to be full immersion in order to symbolize burial. Burial, yeah. As you come out, you're dead. So you don't come out a Jew. You don't come out a Gentile. Mm. You come out dead. Mm. No. You don't come out... I don't... I... That's what it says in Romans 6. That's what it says in Romans 6. You are buried here in baptism and then you rise. You arise in Christ. Yeah, you're yeah, you rise with in Christ. Christ. So you're alive when you come yeah, out, yeah. Yeah. but you're buried with Christ. You're dead to self. Yeah. You're dead to your old self, your, and your old, old nature, life. and yeah. your old life, and your Jewishness or your Gentileness. Yes. yes. Slave or free, male or female. I think what Paul was saying was, when you're buried, all of that disappears. Absolutely. All those distinctions mm. disappear. Mm. So once those distinctions have disappeared and you come out alive in Christ from the burial of uh, baptism, yeah. you're not you anymore, you're a new creation. Yeah. So what does it matter? You're not a Jew anymore, you're not a Gentile anymore. You're not slave anymore. You're not free anymore. So in that sense, these Jews from Judea, although they're believers, weren't applying the message of baptism yeah. when they preached that you have to obey the law of Moses and be circumcised. That was the, 
that's the theor theological hub of it. As we said, it may not necessarily be, it will maybe be used just using it as a tool, but if we need to discuss the theology of it, that's the theology of it. Good, so you interrupt Ian, can you remember where you were? Oh, he was picking up on your point about baptism. But. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the point I was gonna make was, was that we have this tension between Jewish Christian with a Jewish heritage and Gentiles coming in. Now, what happened was that uh, basically the, the Gentiles won. And sadly, I think that we, the Gentiles did win because a lot of the, we lost a lot of our good Jewish heritage because of, of, of the Gentiles. It was a sort of rejection of everything mm. to do with uh, the, the old Hebrew life. And, and, and I don't think that was what was intended. No. No. Um, and so by actually emphasizing the circumcision, what they were actually doing was actually they forced the opposite effect. That's right. And, and, and I think we have to, and we get this situation today where, where Christians often say we're people of the New Testament, they never read the Old Testament, mm. and they never try to actually understand the, the, roots. Whole, the roots of our faith. They don't understand the, 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 the links there are between Judaism and mm. Christianity. There aren't the same links between uh, Christianity and Islam, for example. No. There are there are these links which which we should we should value. That is not to say that there are two ways of salvation, and I want to be very clear about this. The, we're not saying there are two ways of salvation. There's the Hebrew way and there's the Christian way. But what I'm saying is that we've been gra use the scripture. We've been grafted on, but nevertheless we we still grafted on mm. the tree. That's it. You know, we're not a separate tree. No. Mm. I, mean, I mean, for me, it, this is all part of God's sovereignty. So mm. it's not a matter, so, you know, uh, of one side winning or, or the other not. God actually ordained for there to be this blindness towards yeah. the Jewish Messiah Jesus so that the Jewish Messiah Jesus could be shared by Gentiles across yeah. the world. Yeah. The, the, the great danger, let's say sociologically looking at it, would be that it would just remain a sect within Judaism. Yeah. But in the end, it became yeah. something that was if could, worldwide. Yeah. If I can make one final comment on the theology of what the men from Judea were preaching. Yeah. Just, just a smallish point. Unless you're circumcised, they say, you cannot be saved. I think the modern church has this concept, salvation means forgiveness of sins. It does mean forgiveness of sins, but I think when they use that word saved, they were using it in a much larger yes. context. And so what they were objecting to, what they were resentful of, wasn't that these Gentile sins were forgiven. In one sense, I, I don't think they could care less whether God forgave their sins or not. What they didn't want was sharing or having to share or having shared out or diluted the blessings of Abraham, Genesis 12. Because I believe that the word saved to them means way more than forgiveness of sins, which is what we think of the word saved. I think it was a, a bigger word. It was far more comprehensive. So the, one of the reasons theologically that they were insisting on circumcision and following the Jewish law was they saw it as a holistic thing, the whole of life thing. Salvation is a whole of life. Yeah. And we sometimes leave an evan evangelistic meeting with the wrong perception that what the preacher is talking about is God forgives our sins solely. They're talking about a whole holistic entering into the blessings of Abraham. And that's what they resented. But also what we've got to understand what's going on here is that when they talk about the law of Moses, they're not talking about only the Ten Commandments. They're talking about the 613 
commandments, yeah. which are also included the 365 uh, positive things, negative things, you, things you can't do, and, and the rest you can do, and which which was added to the to, to the Ten Commandments. That's why Jesus said you can reduce the Ten Commandments down to two: love God and love your neighbour as yourself, because he knew that they were they'd implemented a system which covered every aspect of their lives mm. and and when they were talking about the law of moses i think in their head was just carrying on christianity as a as a legalistic faith and what what paul get, is getting on to in in his theology is saying you know it's by grace Same. you're saved through Same. faith can i just pick up on on this you are saved. Okay, so it's more than just forgiveness. It, there, there is, um, and this is why this is such an intriguing passage. It's just a few verses, but it actually there is some really deep theology in it because um, Paul, in um, if you do a study, a concordant study of the word saved, you know, you'll see it crop up there in Romans 10, where he says, it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. What, what Paul has, and Barnabas have been preaching, you um, confess the Lord Jesus. Mm. You believe in your heart, you're saved. That would go right against all these people that are grafted, the, the elder brother of, of the prodigal son um, parable, grafted all his life, and then, and then this, you know, sort of whatever That's comes stuff. back from, from you know, a, profligate life confesses the Lord Jesus and he can be saved. That is totally against their whole framework of keeping the law That's to be right. saved. And mm. they conveniently forget Jesus' parable about the workers and the ones who showed Correct. up 10 minutes from the end still got the same wage as somebody who'd been working from dawn. Because right. that's the deal. That was the deal and Jesus said, well, so what? Yeah. And they said, well, it's not fair. That's what they were, they were playing that card. It's not fair. And by the way, there was a deal, and I'm not, I'm not advocating dual co uh, covenant, but there was a deal for the Jewish people. But there was a deeper deal. You know, there was a, there was a um, uh, embedded within the Hebrew scriptures was the Messiah, Jesus, um, uh, who wasn't uh, I something. Think, I think well, what you've just saying, Peter, yeah. all, uh, Peter actually touched on it. Peter actually touched on it and he said, um, what did he say? God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Made no distinction. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, therefore, so he's saying, this is what God did. Verse 10. Yeah. Verse, ten, verse 8 and 9 is what God did. Mm -hmm. Now, Peter is saying, what should our response be? Now, therefore, why? Do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we Powerful. were able to bear? Powerful. So yes, uh, that, nobody's advocating dual covenant. No. All right, and there aren't two ways to be saved. There's only one way to be saved. I just want to be yeah. clear in case yeah. the people write in. Mm. Absolutely true. And verse 10 explains why the first co covenant didn't work. Nobody could keep it. it Peter did knew. work because it pointed to the fact that you couldn't keep it. Yes, it would. It, um, yes, you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not through it's, fulfillment, but through, yeah. yes. And through even God's the Lord Jesus in, in Matthew, um, uh, Sermon on the Mount, he said that to, to a Jewish, I mean, it's, it's, it's in Hebrew, I mean, to, to a Jewish um, audience, he's giving them, as it were, what keeping the law really need, requires. You yeah, know, you, you think something wrong in your heart, you've sinned, you know, and, mm, yeah. um, uh, and love your enemies, otherwise you've sinned sort of thing. So, so uh, he created this burden that, uh, that, that, you know, of commitment that was impossible to keep. And that's why in, in Matthew 11, he says, yeah. Put your, uh, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. In other words, um, I think I've just demonstrated to you, with all of your observance of the law, you can't do it. You can't bear it, therefore trust in me. Mm. And it's the same message here in one line from Peter. Yeah. 
first two demonstrates how decisive Paul was. So last week we talked about how it was Paul that decided mm. to go to Derby, and then Barnabas came with him. Mm. Here it's Paul before Barnabas. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with yeah. them, yeah. so they weren't going to stand for it. Just because yeah. they were from Judea, it doesn't mean that ba Paul and Barnabas were going to stand aside. They weren't going and to let, let them. Go. No. no, no. That's right. That's right. And. and but it wasn't them that decided to go to Jerusalem. They was they were. It was the the elders the others who, in Antioch sent which them. Which is fair enough. Mm. I mean, they weren't wicked. <laughs> no, <laughs> they just I, had a different viewpoint. But, but it was interesting for me. I'm just jumping a few verses here. Verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul. Mm. They knew between Barnabas and Paul. They knew that Paul would put his mouth in it. Although Paul did all the preaching and all the teaching to all the Gentiles, mm. when it came to addressing the Jews, Barnabas probably said, I better handle this, Paul. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. It's interesting uh, I mean, that it was it Barnabas who did the talking. That's right. And Paul just... He led the way. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Which is also good. I, I take your point about Paul, but I'm a little bit more, I have a, a more um, idealistic view of Paul. I, I, I think Paul may have said to Barnabas, I don't want to be um, shouting my own phrases. <coughs> That's also possible, yeah, okay. <laughs> the thing is that what, what we know that Luke switched them. Yeah. I just want to re-emphasize what this was about. The, this was about, verse five, it says, the Pharisees who believed rose up and saying, it's necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, yeah. we're talking here about the 613 Mitzvot war laws, which are 365 laws which are things you can't, shouldn't do, and there's 248 or whatever things you have to do. And, and it, it, it covered everything. It covered all the festivals. It covered, it covered how they worked on a Sunday, on a Sabbath. It, it covered everything, every aspect of their lives. So what they're actually saying is that we've got to re-establish, this church is coming and it's, it's, it's chaos. We've got to re-establish a system. Mm. Right? And, and I think there's a battle going on here. And, and I think it's a battle which um, happens continuously in the Christian life of the old versus the new. Mm. That we naturally bring something of ourselves and our history into the, the Christian faith. However, we have to be very, very careful that we do not shape the Christian faith according to our experience, but our experience of the Christian faith is shaped by God and through his word. And, and that's really one of the important fundamental principles which is which we see today a lot, that uh, people come and they shape their, because Christianity has become a largely individualistic faith, people tend to shape their Christian faith according to their experience. So what my faith will allow me to carry on my life. Yeah, yeah. exactly. As it is with maybe going to church once every couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not like that at all. It's about a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ where he is Lord. And as we looked at last week, where we talked about discipleship, about sacrifice mm -hmm. and such like, it's nothing, it's nothing, not, not to, you don't import your old life into the new life. It's yeah. a completely new life. Anyone who's Christ, he is a new creation, the old things passed away. Very good. Um, just you, you mentioned about the, those you know, it, who stood up in Jerusalem. So they've, they've arrived in when they'd come to Jerusalem, verse 4. But it's interesting in verse, uh, uh, the earlier verse, verse 2, 
It said that they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem. So I think it is the same group yeah. who confronted them or, or dissented and disputed yeah, so, with so them the, in Antioch were there in Jerusalem, you know, restating the point. Yes, yes that's right. Mm. That's right. So we come on to verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. Mm. I just wanted to draw attention to the word elders. Mm. If, it had sim if Luke had simply said, now the apostles came together to consider this matter, then we would understand it because the apostles were in charge. We get that. But it's including elders. Mm. So elders, was they'd been appointing elders. Later on, as we said, Paul wrote to Titus and said, appoint elders in, in, in Crete like I told you to. The appointment of elders is quite significant because they were in a position to judge theology. And this brings a us, better position. This yeah. brings us back to our definition of apostolic authority because this makes it clear that there is a distinction between the, the Jerusalem Council was made up of uh, uh, apostles who as we know, the definition of apostle, that they had been with Christ and been appointed by Christ. We come to Paul later on, that's where the dispute arises. Now, they, and they appointed the elders, but the elders had a position of leadership in the church as well. But it was, it was in many ways parallel, but there's similar differences that the apostles have been taught by Christ, apostolic teaching, and the apostles had taught the elders. So it's a second generation yeah. of So you can teaching. see how a hierarchy can develop Well, it's in not a hierarchy. No, you can it's, see how it develops in it, people's minds. It, it does develop yeah. in people's minds, but it's not a hierarchy. No. It's basically a, you know, so well, the word apostle means sent. Who were they sent by? They were sent by Jesus. Go you therefore into all the world, make disciples of all nations, right? The, the, the presbyter, the leader, uh, the, the elder was again, was a leader. It came directly from the Jewish faith where an elder was a leader among the Jews. Right? So there's a subtle difference. Now, the, the reason why this is important uh, is this, is that the apostles bring the apostolic teaching and that's mm, why that's it's, right. it's important. Now, we can have a dispute as to whether Paul was an apostle or whether he was not. Mm -hmm. uh, because by the strict definition of apostolic authority, he wasn't. Mm. But he was according to his letters. He called was to be an apostle. A, a, no, absolutely. But he's also absolutely. According to absolutely. Acts. Now, yes. we have to actually... Previously, we, we yes, read that. Exactly. Apostles. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. but then we, then we come to the, the point that apostles exist but do they have the authority to change apostolic teaching? Um, you see, that's, a, that's a point I wasn't really, I wasn't thinking along those well, tracks. Well, that, but well I, no, I, believe, I would say that Believe not. me, that it's, it's, it's a relevant one. I would say exactly no. Yeah, no. No, they don't. Um, so, what, but, so what is the difference between the apostles, the apostle Paul, and the apostles that have been appointed in a later date, where it talks about mm -hmm. apostles. That's a good question. What, 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 yeah, what, so you what definitely is the said the apostles' teaching, because that comes up earlier in, in Acts. They yeah. gave themselves to the apostles' teaching, to prayer, breaking of bread, prayer. Right, so, so. And what was the apostles' teaching? It was actually rooted in the scriptures. Right. Um, but it had that authority um, okay. that came from being with now, the Lord I, Jesus. I, I would say the apostle Paul is a second generation apostle. That, sure, that, sure. That, that, that I would say that, that it, the word- It's also the missing link, of what, you know, before they cast lots to pick up Matthias yeah, yeah. after Judas, because yeah, okay. they mixed up disciples and apostles. So, so it, it's, it's an interesting yeah. point because I would actually advocate, and if you read Paul's teaching and you study it as you do as a, a preacher yeah, and that, yeah. What you find, it's full of the teaching of Jesus. People say, I, I, I follow Jesus, I don't follow Paul. Paul's uh, 
it, Paul's teaching is apostolic teaching, yeah. whom, which he learned from the original yeah. apostles, because he, he didn't spend any time with Jesus yeah. except in prayer, but he, he, and, and that. So he, he spent time with the apostles. So he, so the word apostle has two meanings. One, it means, uh, well, it's one. It means means sent. And for the church, it means the author of apostolic teaching that handed directly from Jesus. But then it has a secondary meaning, meaning the one who is sent. Yeah, very good. Can I just throw in, not to divert us too much, but you can see from this passage, if you read up to a certain point and no further, that uh, how it developed in people's minds that Peter was the pontiff, oh, yeah. as it were. Oh, yeah. you know, and you can see how that tradition goes. But... Um, it, it's sort of, um, as it were, balanced out by the fact it's James who then comes up and endorses what Peter said. So, so in other words, we think, oh yes, oh this is a clear hierarchy. So they, they, they went to these folk in Antioch and then there was a hierarchy up to the apostles and then there was the, the, the absolute pinnacle of Pontifus Maximus or whatever of Peter. Yeah, um, but that is not actually what it's saying. Mm. Peter got up because it's Peter, mm. <laughs> and, and and he he gave a great correcting preach from his experience yeah. in um, Caesarea. Yeah. Well, what we're observing is the, the human dynamics. Yeah. We saw how during the first missionary journey that Paul went on, he started out as Saul. He came home as Paul. He sta started out as a teacher or a prophet, he came home as an apostle. Yeah. Why do I say that? Because we studied that a few weeks ago in uh, uh, chapter 14, verse 14. Luke actually says, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard this, they tore their clothes and apostles. Mm -hmm. By middle of chapter 14, Barnabas and Paul were apostles, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> Peter was the main spokesperson. John could have been because he had enough theology and enough closeness and intimacy with Jesus and everything else. And later on, he wrote the Gospel of John. He could have been, but he was a quiet guy. Mm. He was an introvert. He barely spoke. He just accompanied Peter and went around healing people. At this stage, a generation later, he starts writing books. Uh, okay. So at this time, you'd have thought, human dynamics, Peter is in charge. But we read in... Galatians, that Paul saw a different side. Mm. When James, or people from James showed up, it says Peter withdrew from eating with Gentiles. So Peter considered James yeah, high, higher. to be a higher authority than himself. And yet James wasn't even one of the original 12 disciples. So again, he was an apostle after Jesus' death and resurrection, same as Paul. And so, yes, what happens is when people make speeches, the final one is made by the highest authority. Yes. So you go up. That's the point. Yeah? yeah. So you got, you know, the two sides and then the pronouncement. Mm. And it was James who made the final decision or the saint's final pronouncement, or the final judgment. Mm. That's, that is interesting. And in it, he said that known to God from eternity. So, so there's one even higher. Um, he than, himself, than all James, the, James but, himself, of but course. But definitely, I, mean, I think they had a good structure in having a council. Uh, and that's, you know, of course, James in this instance was, was clearly decisive. He was um, decisive. But, but there wasn't a hierarchy within the council, that's my point. Right, and... It just disabuses us of the idea that Peter was the pontiff. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And <laughs> we won't go there, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, but the, 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 the interesting thing is that the sect of the Pharisees who believed that it is necessary to observe the law of Moses probably thought they had a ringer in James. Mm. Yes. They were probably of the view that James would side with them. Yeah. Mm. But when push came to shove, James went with what the Holy Spirit was telling them, to telling him, yeah. and not what the Pharisees were telling him. Mm. There was no small dispute, which means that there was pandemonium. That's right. They were That's shouting. Right. I mean, these were Jewish 
guys yeah. arguing. Mm. You can't get more argumentative. Mm. And, and James didn't equivocate. He, he was decisively in support of what Peter said. He wasn't saying on the one the hand and on the other video. He didn't do any of that. He brought the in. prophets in as well. Yeah. But the gospel should first go to the Gentiles. That was so counterintuitive. Mm. I mean, they were all Jews. And, and there they are saying, look, this is, this is basically what the prophets have said. That's right. And the other difference between Peter and James is Peter went with his experience. And that's why he had those experiences. That's why Jesus said, you will deny me three times. Mm. Everything to Peter was experiential. Mm. And he was a witness to things that he saw. That's why he was a very powerful witness to the resurrection. Mm. Yeah. He was powerful because he was there at the tomb and he saw the empty tomb. Exactly. He was a witness. And he said, this is my experience. Cornelius got the, uh, the Holy Spirit. But James came up with theology. Mm. You see? So Peter says the experience is such and such. God gave the Gentiles the Holy Spirit without having first been circumcised. That's it. Think about it. And then James came along and says, well, what do the prophets say? What does the scripture tell us? Yes, scripture affirms Paul's point, Barnabas's point. And by the way, just in the final, we're in the final couple of minutes, that those final verses, it's not as though James is saying, you know, you can ditch, you know, um, m morality. You, 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 can, you can ditch the, these other um, things. He said, no, I think we'll and pick we it up. wrote yeah. to them to abstain from yeah. this. Yeah, I, th I think, we'll I, pick I think, that up I think there's a lot in those, which I think we need to yeah. maybe, maybe look at separately next time, because I, I don't think we can do it in two minutes. No. Uh, but um, yeah, yeah, but... I was we, trying to keep to my I know tradition you were. I know you were. rigidly, but you, you sort of outlier well, as you've just come no, in and blown away yeah, my yeah, plan. Well, but, next week we will look at the letter but, itself, so I think we will cover it. there are important questions Sorry. here. Can you eat blood pudding? Mm. As Christians. Can, That's can, next week. That's next week. I mean, can you eat blood pudding? Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, why is sexual immorality important? Is God well, approved? Morality, yeah. Or yeah. immorality. Yeah. Well, you know, mm. why, why, why is it? Exactly. And, and, and it's all questions which, which need to be uh, answered today because all the givens which were accepted in previous generations are all being questioned. It's all up in the air. And yet here in scriptures, you've yeah. got the answers to, to, to the questions. So I'll just tell you what's in, I, I'm just thinking here about what is in Paul's mind um, as he listens to all of this, because Paul is the one who's, who's the great theologian, you know, that we look back through history and say he, he had it. Um, Romans 9, 10, 11 were, as it were, birthed here. Mm. Paul just earwigging what is being said and hearing what God is saying. Uh, you read Romans 9, 10, 11, and then you see the doxology, which is there summed up in verse 18, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, um, uh, his paths beyond tracing out. Here it is in that one verse. So he would have heard all of that and then heard James say, there's something deeper here and God's actually... And we're not going to unravel the whole thing in this conversation, as we weren't in this Bible study. He's saying, for from him, to him, and through him are all things to God be the glory but if you put that first, then I think you, you, you can grapple with some of the other minutiae. We're in the last minute or, or 30 seconds, Ian. It's your turn to have the final word. I, I, think, I think you've got to actually look at the remarkable way that the church would move from where it was in a matter of five, ten years to where they are here. It's brilliant. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Carry on. Thank you.